It's Mike Farrell, MikeFarrellSports.com. I'm here with Pete Futek, CollegeFootballNews.com. Uh, happy to have you on here. Another person who can actually talk to me, at least on a national basis, about what's going on with NIL and the transfer portal and and get someone else's take because I'm tired of my own. My, my own take is, <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? Honestly, what are you going to do? Um, kids deserve to earn money. Um, it's going to be very interesting with these new booster guidelines that are put in place here. I'm sure you've talked about it all day. What's your take on what the NCAA has done over the last couple of days? What's going on? I mean, the collectives, is that what we're uh, now? We're talking about the collectives. So let's start with a basic premise. And I am, you know, you're, I'm more interested in your take on this than, like you said, than living in my bubble and hearing my own thoughts and my own crazy thoughts. Uh, I'm under the, the, the belief that there, this is not a problem, that they're looking for solutions to something that is actually the answer to everything that these the, the college athletic departments should be and do. Now, I get the idea. You don't want them to be thought of as professionals. And I get these are institutions of higher learning. And, you know, it's you, you've got this weird little side business side hustle here of college sports to go along with their their what they normally are supposed to do but the reality is here i don't know why the conference commissioners are bringing this up at all because look at what they've got they've got a free labor force now it's a whole other discussion about compensation about uh, uh scholarships and things like that but they have a free labor force that someone else is paying for so they don't have to pay these guys money. The, the, the market sorts itself out. The Jordan Addisons are going to get this. this. The backup punter from a Sunbelt school is going to get this. And you just kind of know how the system works. They don't have to deal with Title IX, don't have to deal with out-of-pocket anything. All they have to do is figure out how to kind of just shift the balance here in the transfer portal and timing and things and just let it all play out. Now, I do think the problem is in – uh, the transfer portal and the unfettered free agency. But in terms of name, image, and likeness, all right, most college kids get a job at Starbucks or wherever, you know, making sandwiches or doing whatever just to get by. This is just a extra side gig, but on a much higher scale. And I think the worry is, um, and from this is from college coaches, you know, so the, the I'm not going to call, I guess I shouldn't call them bottom feeders, but the, the, the have nots, the, the, the lower level, the group of fives and the lower level power five. The less fortunate, the ones that don't have the uh, gajillion dollar budgets. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, we can go into what's a blue blood forever. I mean, is Nebraska still a blue blood? I don't know. Let's just say the teams that aren't winning um, are going to get poached by the teams that, that are. And the teams that are winning don't care about that. They love it. You know, Nick Saban can go and take the best player from Georgia tech and Jameer Gibbs, and he can just go and take anybody he wants. Um, yep. But the worry here is you got to please those um, lower level programs. And then the higher level programs complaints are, well, we don't want our locker rooms divided so greatly. Uh, we don't want Bryce young to make $10 million, you know, and our, our, our right guard to make $200. Um, it, it's going to lead to a lot of, uh, I guess, cancerous locker rooms, lack of unity and all that stuff. So you got the complaints from the, the big wigs, which are rich people problems. Then you got the poor people problems and you're trying to meet them in between. Um, and also, I mean, the boosters, let's be honest, it's not fair. There's not the same amount of money um, in Piscataway, New Jersey for Rutgers as there is in Austin, Texas for the Longhorns. And you know, that's another disparity. Um, we've always had that with academics. We've always had that with facilities. Now on a larger scale, the worry is paying players. You're going to have nobody go to these smaller schools. And when they do go to these smaller schools, if they have a good year, they're going to be gone to the bigger schools. Yeah, yeah. I, to, to a couple points to what you just said. I would say when in terms of the multi-million dollar generational wealthy head coaches worrying about their locker rooms, boo-hoo, that's mm -hmm. what you get paid for. You're the you're literally the adult in the room. 
Uh, that's what you're supposed to figure out. And I think the kids get it. I mean, as is, you know, you, you know, they know the guys who are going to be the first round draft pick who, you know, they, you hear this all the time from kids. This is my best friend who's, you know, borrowing money to get a pizza and 10 minutes later, he's a multimillionaire. It, it just, once he gets drafted, I mean, they, they, they know that they, they can figure that out. I think they just want the opportunity for that. And I actually think you, you hit, you hit the nail right on the head. But I would almost say Piscataway, New Jersey is actually the wrong example because that's New York City. I almost think that it, what I don't get in all this is why George Klevkov, the Pac-12 commissioner, is wigging out about this. He's got the markets. I would almost think if you're the SEC, and it is one of the fatal flaws, I think, in their quest for world domination, they got markets. They don't have L.A., they don't have Chicago, they don't have New York, and they've got kind of a very regionalized product that needs a USC to be good, that needs Ohio State to be good, that needs Clemson and others to be good so they can show just how good they are. I think the freak out would probably be on the SEC side and say, wait a minute, who's got the, who's got, not just about the, which boosters have the money, it's which schools have the potential opportunity in a professional sports environment to give these kids something bigger. And that's why I think USC is going to freak everybody out because that's the dream scenario. That's L. I mean, Pete Carroll was able to figure that one out and have, you know, the, all these guys were able to know if you're in LA, you're the rock star. If you're USC and USC football is rocking even more than the Rams now, even more than the chargers, maybe not as much as the Lakers when it's rocking, it's, it's going, but USC, UCLA should be able to go after this. If you're a big giant city school that has the infrastructure that has uh, the, the interest to have this money funneling in, there are going to be more opportunities. Now, we might be making too much out of this because ask any you know professional sports guy, and it's one of the big shockers. Everyone thinks that as soon as you turn pro, oh, here come the endorsement money, and it just doesn't work out like that. So to me, if a bunch of weird boosters want to give a kid a car, okay, you know, fine. It's been happening since the start of, you know, since there were cars uh, in college sports. Uh, but I think this is going to be as much as, like you said, maybe the rich schools as opposed to the, you know, maybe not Rutgers, but maybe more like the central Michigans uh, and Utah states of the world, uh, as opposed to like the power five schools riffing off each other. And these kids will figure it out. You know, the, the market will dictate where they can go and, uh, they'll just go where the best opportunities are going to be, like they always sort of have. Now, with that said, I do think they have to put limits on how these guys can go. Because even in professional sports leagues, you can't just go back and forth depending on the depth chart. Just right. leave, yeah, well, I'm back up, so I'm going to leave. So that I do think, yeah, as a player's right believe, rights believer and stuff, I do believe that NIL is fine, but it's not fair to the players, not fair to the coaches, not fair to everybody. If the second the depth chart comes out, the vultures swoop in and take the number two backup uh, quarterback. I will I will play devil's advocate here though. I, I you know, before the Rams won the Super Bowl, nobody cared about football in LA. True. Uh, there was at one point no NFL football team in LA, um, no fan base. Then they moved two teams to LA and everybody's like wondering why. Uh, those games aren't well attended. And USC, yep. when they when they were rocking with Pete Carroll, things were great. When they're not great, nobody cares. Um, you know, L.A. is going to bring the players. Will the players bring the wins? Will the wins bring the fans? That's the big exactly. question. Piscataway, New York City, nobody cares about Rutgers at all. Nobody, exactly. not one person on this, no, no offense to Rutgers fans, not one person on this planet from New York City cares about Rutgers. I mean, here's, the, the, here's the differentiating factor. All it would take is one really bored billionaire booster from maybe Rutgers or, you know, wherever it is to say, you know what? I, that's why I'm, I'm shocked, for example, not to cut you off, forgive me here, but Oregon. I'm waiting for Uncle Phil to figure out how to make that, hey, you come to Oregon and we're going to name a shoe after you or something yeah, like that. That'll happen. It, it, takes one, it takes one really bored old right. billionaire but at it's any a risk. random school. It's a risk, man. I mean, you know, uh, obviously Kevin Plank, put in a ton of money at, at, at you know, with Under Armour in Maryland and the, the Terrapins definitely. never broke through. Phil, Phil Knight's been definitely obviously putting money into facilities at Oregon. They still haven't won a national championship. They, they, you know, obviously got close. Um, it's a, it's a tough investment. And, and the one thing I learned last year in NIL is that the commodities market in, in college football players is very scary to rich people, rich people. Yeah. Rich people are very, very annoying and frugal, <laughs> believe it or not. That's why they're rich. They're frugal, right? So they don't want to lose money. So those people that invested in Spencer Rattler last year, right, and threw all their money, and we're talking about agents, we're talking about 
um, you know, sponsorships we're talking about, as well as, uh, you know, collectibles and, and you know, the, the big autographed companies all threw money into him, all down the drain, wasted entirely. There's a landfill full of his jerseys and, and helmets signed by Spencer Rattler for Oklahoma. Along, right next to the Bo Nix energy drinks? Is yeah. that where they are? Nobody yeah. cares about them. Nobody wants them. <laughs> and they're a waste of money. He, was, he made millions of dollars at the National Collectibles show last summer, signing Oklahoma stuff. Uh, that was wasted money. Um, and then the perfect storm of last year with Derek King, Sam Howell, um, DJ Wangalele, guys like that who were invested in heavily, heavily, uh, and just didn't pan out, has everybody kind of scared um, that, you know, Quinn Ewers in Columbus, they're either going to transfer or they're going to stink or get hurt and you're going to lose all your money. So I get that rich people do have this money to throw around and maybe some rich booster who wants Rutgers to be good and wants to go out there and get Arch Manning or somebody. I don't know if that's going to happen, first of all, from their perspective. And if it does, how do you get that kid to go to play at Rutgers? And I don't want to use Rutgers. Let's use, let's use uh, Duke. How do you get that kid to go to play at Duke? I don't care how much money you, you give him. He's not going to want to play there. And, and, and the big city, you know, Pittsburgh's a pretty good sports city, a horrible college city. And, and here we have, you know, Jordan Addison out of pit and going to either Alabama, which is not a big city, um, you know, LA, yes, Austin, yes. And the Green Bay Packers are very good in the NFL when it comes to fan base and they're in the middle of nowhere. So there's a lot of arguments back and forth as to who was going to benefit from NIL. Would it be Lincoln, Nebraska? Or would it be Miami, Florida? I think the answer is both, but there's no perfect scenario and no one's figured out the formula to do it yet. Well, and the big winner in all this, as you're describing, it seems like it's college athletics in general, where the perfect example is Pitt, where, okay, let's say, forget the NIL money from the boosters. How about just the endorsement money? And so early on last year, when Kenny Pickett starts to rock and roll, and he's having this miracle, not quite Joe Burrow season, but a breakout kind of year, and he becomes a Heisman caliber guy. Pitt's obviously becoming a, a big time team. It's going to be in the ACC title hunt. When, okay, then maybe there's a way that some agent figures out that on the fly quickly, all right, Gator, Gatorade or Nike or whomever, right? when, one of these big ticket items, be, be flexible on this. We, all right, we know that Spencer Rattler is not it. This is the guy this year. Yep. And so, okay, sign him quickly to do this quick hit for, you know, six weeks. You're, you've got a, a McDonald's deal or something like this. The, the winner in this would probably be college, ESPN and college sports because look what happened in the bowl game. Kenny Pickett opts out. Uh, Kenneth Walker opts out because it's an exhibition bowl game. They don't want to hurt their draft stock. But if they're getting paid by XYZ company to represent a product, it's worth it to the company saying, hey, you're ain't opting out. You're playing in this bowl game, which then all of a sudden keeps them around. And so the argument right now is if they're not getting paid, there's no, I mean, we love college sports. Obviously, we think at a different level, but on a, at a business type of level, Will Anderson should not be playing one more down to college football. No. You, know, the, the, you know, these guys who are the obvious multimillionaire, I mean, how do you ask a, you know, a kid, don't, you know, if you right now, you're a top 10 pick next year and you're generational wealthy, and the only thing you don't have to do is go out there and get injured. What are you doing playing? Right. But if you're getting the NIL money, maybe that's keeping you around a little bit and that's stopping you from going off because, you know, bird in hand, a Will Anderson, I'm just, I don't even know his NIL deals, but let's say, hey, I might make $3 million right now being, you know, Bryce Young or Will Anderson or CJ Stroud or Jackson Smith and Jigba. And okay, let's let's take this money out of hand. I have an agent. I've got deals going forward. It's essentially everything that happened with Reggie Bush is now kosher. Like that's the actual formula. They have right. the marketing company. They have the subway deals in place. They have everything set up for you. So if you're a kid in college, let, let the adult agent front you $5 million to be your, their agent. And then you're staying in school. Otherwise, more and more, instead of opting out of bowl games, these guys are going to say, what am I doing risking my, my livelihood, my family generational wealth playing any college football? I'm just going to work out and get ready for the draft in six months. 
Yeah. And that's an argument too. And I had that with somebody yesterday, like, will it make kids play more? Um, like, you know, Xavier Worthy is the one I, I mentioned because, you know, if he has a tremendous season this year and he was able to come out as a two and done player, he would be up there probably with Addison, with Smith and Jake, but maybe even ahead of them. Tra- depending. Trayvon Walker is probably the seventh pick in the draft. If the, if you could have had the two and done year, or even like the, the underclassmen deal. I mean, you yeah. know, Stroud goes, Young goes, Jet, Will Anderson yeah. goes, Smith and Jim. I mean, well, and, know, and, so and this is yeah, Travion Henderson, Travion Henderson is another oh, good example. Like if definitely. he has a great season next year, does he sit out his third year? Will NIL money make him play? Um, no one's going to make anybody play in a bowl game. I will tell you that there's not yeah. a representative or agent out there that's going to sign a deal for one of these kids, Will Anderson or whoever it is that says, okay, you give us this amount of money and I guarantee you're going to play in a bowl game. Because but if it's a fringier guy, you're right. If it, Will Anderson's probably the wrong example here and Kenny Pickett's probably the wrong example. It's the, you know, how many times do we see the kid? I, I can't, I can't remember if Sincere McCormick sat out for UTSA. I think he did yeah. uh, but it's, it's the guys who are the who are the the realistic middle round to later round guys who are going to sit just because it's the smart thing to do and they get ready for the drag get ready for the combine start training might be those guys that stick around maybe not the, the you're right the top 10 guys it's just there's no point in playing well, more down a it's a ball. it's a risk for a sponsor too so let's say you're a sponsor right and you're you're you're, you're got an nil deal with matt corral and yep. matt corral plays in that bowl game because of you you know yeah let's say hershey's you know chocolate bars or whatever people are gonna hate you they're gonna hate you (laughs) so much because that kid got hurt it could have ended his career i mean it wasn't a career ending injury did it lead it helped him lead to sliding in the draft slightly maybe Um, yeah that's just a bad investment so even if a kid like a will anderson says you know the college football playoffs going to make Will Anderson play, not NIL, but let's sure. say that he's sponsored by a, 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 a company that's given him millions of dollars. And that's part of the incentive for him to play in that playoff game. And he blows out his knee and, and we're talking Jalen Smith. He goes from yeah, or Jamison Williams for Jamison Williams would be the perfect. Yeah. Example yeah. Yeah. That. Right. But actually that's the actual championship. The guy's going to want to play for the national play. Well, no, that's, that's true. But Jalen Smith played in, in a, in a bowl game, Notre Dame, uh, Ohio state. It was, it was a Jake, junior six Jake, bowl. Jake, Butt, yeah. Yeah. Top five pick. And he went to the top of the second round. He had a nice career. He got a second contract, but he's already out of the league now. Yeah. Could have ruined his entire you know, future. Now, again, there's insurance policies for these high draft picks. But those are, yeah, but those are never quite as, plus the, forget, you, you don't get your dream of playing. You don't get the no. second contract and no. it's, and they're, they're not as cut and dry as I think the average fan thinks they are. I mean, it, it's kind of hard to tell the average fan. Yeah. The kid just gets a couple million dollars for this, but you ain't getting a hundred million dollars that he might've gotten if he was just the no. superstar player. No. So, um, so that's a, but that, that's the high end part of this. But in the, but to the overall point here is you're right. I think the market's going to dictate this. I think sponsorship wise, you know, Trevor Lawrence would have been the dream because the guy wins the national championship as a freshman, and then yep. there you pile the money on him, so you know you got him for a couple of years. But that's going to be rare. I mean, that's going to you know that that's just not going to happen all that much. Um, but the market will dictate that. But really, the the if there is a problem, if you're going back to your, your original thought is that it's not just the, the superstars, it's the, the mid-range guys, and that you're worried if you're a coach that you can't release a depth chart or you can't even tell a guy that you're prepared as the number one guy because the second you do that, you're going to lose. And if you're that coach, if you're not actively pinging all the MAC schools for their best players and you know all the other uh, group of five conferences for their top guys, you're probably not doing your job. So uh, this does have to be reined in at least somewhat. Yeah, and Jerry, you know, Jerry Bohan is a great example. Yep. Veranda could have named co-starters. He could have dragged this out until August. He was honest with the kid. He was honest with the world. The kid gets an opportunity at USF now, but that's very rare. That's not going to happen. There's going to be a lot of co-number ones at depth charts. Uh, for us as media, we're never going to be able to figure it out post spring. Yeah, as I keep saying, God, God help the, God bless the people right now who have to write a print preview on every single possible level. Oh, but oh that was my. hard enough. That, yeah. that was hard enough to do. I Rhett Bomar, 
is my uh, my cautionary tale. I even have a box of uh, preview mags for, for I think it was Scout back in the day, where we went hard saying this is going to be Rhett Bomar's year, and then, <laughs> like 15 seconds after it went to publish, uh, he got booted from Oklahoma. Well, and now forget it if you're and trying to funny, put it together because he got booted for a no show job. Yeah, and now we're talking about the opposite of no show jobs. We're like exactly. encouraging no show jobs. The thing I have a problem with, and I'm glad the NCAA finally, you know, first of all, they've screwed this up since the beginning. As we know, they're waiting for Congress to intervene. Congress said, forget it. Uh, there are still state laws in effect that they're not going to be able to uh, administer penalties to universities because they're following state laws. There's no federal laws for NIL. Uh, you got Sankey and everybody else begging Congress to come in and create federal laws. It's still a nightmare and a mess. But from the beginning, what they should have said is they, they said it very lightly. They said, OK, NIL is OK, but you're not allowed to buy players. OK, that's like me talking to my dog before I leave the house, <laughs> but I leave a full meal on the on the kitchen floor. Yeah. And I say, OK, you're not allowed to eat that. And I leave the room and I go home. I, I come home two hours later. It's annihilated. The dog is, you know, puked and crapped everywhere. That's where we're at now, 10 months in. And now they're finally saying, oh, we're going to we're going to break down uh, on this stuff. And I like it. I like it because here's what I don't want. I don't want rich people in a room with annoying rich coaches. Right. And having them dictate who gets who. I don't want kind of hard to say, hey. Hey kid, you can't go get money while Nick Saban's out there putting on a blue jacket. And acting they can't go after the players. They yeah. can't go after the players, but they can go after Saban. They can go after the coaches. They can go after the uh, programs, and that's what they're doing. Antitrust will kill if you go say Bryce Young. You can't make this amount of money unless the federal government dictates it. Um, you know, and, and, and makes it a, a, a you know federal law. But you can go to Alabama and say, listen, if we find out that one of these boosters that's paying him was in communication with you, you're going to get dinged. You're going to lose scholarships. You're going to lose bowl appearances and things like that. And that scares the bejesus out of schools. And I like schools scared because when <laughs> schools are scared, there's less cheating and we have a little bit more of an even playing ground. Yeah. And, and, and not to make anything political right now, I mean, but like, uh, I know he's not uh, representative anymore, but like the former players who were in like an Anthony Gonzalez or a Cory Booker or somebody who uh, who actually was in a system at a relatively high end. What if, you know, a former player or anybody or any congressman or senator pipes up and says, all right, so we're supposed to say to these kids, don't get a job or don't get paid or don't. And colleges, you're complaining about what here? Like, what do you, what, what is, who's, where is the, who's getting, I guess that who's getting injured? Who is, where's the, where's the harm in what's happening with name, image, and likeness? You have a bunch of bruised ego boosters. I mean, you make your, making the jobs harder on coaches. I mean, where is the, you know, where's the problem well, here that, that they need to really dive into? I will say this, as we get further and further into this, and, and another thing that was sort of overlooked by a lot of people was, the fact that divisions are no longer required for a championship game. Now that's something that's been just glossed over because of NIL and, and yeah. you know, we're going after the boosters, but that's the start of mega conferences. It's the start of super conferences. It's this also the start of us being in the 40 range for power five, which will not. All right. I, let me, let me, I'm going to ask ahead. you a question I was asked earlier today. I'll see if you're taking it. So I was on another show and they asked me this question. I kind of paused for a second. They said, okay, what if that happens? What if the Gene Smith, uh, uh, Ohio State athletic director is saying that, well, we, we are getting to a point where we're going to just really be, he, he said all FBS schools, but really he kind of means the power five superstar schools all combined to afford one thing. And my, my response was, why? Because as is, the conferences can do whatever they want. They control their own media deals. They control their own worlds. They control their own rules. The NCAA doesn't have anything to do with the Bulls. They can kind of figure out however they want to adjust their own deals. It's actually a better deal for the SEC and the Big Ten, the biggest of the big boy conferences, to create their own gigs. And even if they combine forces, that's fine. But for this to be a national sport, not some you know regional thing, you need the entire country to care. Right. So why would a, like you said, the 40 team mega <clears throat> thing actually work when the conferences don't really need to do that? 
you know, greed. I mean, <laughs> They'll treat it all for a little bit more. Well, look at the SEC. Do they need Texas and Oklahoma? Yeah. I know. For the life of me, this is a whole other podcast that you and I should do sometime. Definitely. For the life of me, I do not get why Texas is doing this. It makes absolutely zero sense from every possible But you level. want to know why the SEC wants them? Because they're afraid someone else is going to get them. I don't know how Texas is not in the Big Ten. I don't know how Oklahoma is, is in the Pac-12. It's how rich but, people work. I'm not rich, right? I dove into <laughs> NIL for a year. Dove in, right? And I, I, I dealt with a lot of rich people. I'm not rich. I learned about the rich. The rich are greedy. The SEC is greedy. They want Texas and Oklahoma. They don't want to hurt the Big 12. They don't care about the Big 12. They think they're better than everybody else, and they always have. They're worried that the Big 10 is going to get those schools. And then we got a battle on our hands. So let's get ahead of everybody else. Let's get those. Now it's going to be, let's get ahead of everybody else and let's get these next two schools. And that's where you're going to end up with either two major conferences or one mega conference. And it's not sensical. It, you know, it doesn't make sense. Just like you said, Texas going to the SEC doesn't make sense. It's about greed. And the worry, I think, for these athletic directors and presidents of these schools, the Wake Forests of the world, the the, the Rutgers, the Boston College, the, the, the Dukes, the schools are going to be pushed out and they're going to lose all that revenue. And that's going to hurt the university itself. And then when you get into hurting education and hurting like because that's going to cause them to cut those same rich people that you're talking about that are funneling money to xyz player also funnel money into the new library and the new right you know blah blah building and the new other stuff too right so those are the ones who especially in a place like tech why do they want texas that's the it, i think it's the most uh profitable athletic department going it I mean, is it's, it uh, is it's so, number and, one Has and oklahoma is oklahoma and oklahoma is oklahoma but, so it's but the, the so the other part about rich people is they they pretend to care about things they're supposed to care about, right? And this is a political discussion, and I hate politics, and I don't have an opinion on politics really. But they're supposed to care about education, right? You're supposed to care about education of kids. So if you let things go nil crazy, if you let this become uh, you know one mega conference with 24 teams or two two mega conferences with a total of 38 teams. And you you punt those other schools out. You've got what's right up the road for me, which is UConn, right? UConn is a very, very small example. They were in a group of five conference. They sucked. Nobody wanted them. They tried to get into every power five league. They tried to piggyback with you name a school. They tried to piggyback their way into a power five. And well, you're saying the quiet part out loud here is that everyone thinks, why isn't Kansas in the Big Ten already? Why isn't Duke it? basketball it doesn't do it it's no. football 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 basketball does basketball does mm. not generate the Nobody revenue cares. that football oh. does and to 2007 that was a big discussion like okay you've got a great basketball program that's of interest to us because back then the money was it wasn't comparable but it was at least within the realm of comparable now here we are 15 years later football's here basketball's here right should be even here where you can't even see my hand. And that's where you get these programs like a UConn who went from, listen, they were a BCS school. They went to the Fiesta Bowl. They went to one. Yeah, they had a big year. Yeah. Now they're an independent. They stink. They've got <laughs> millions and millions of dollars of facilities that they've invested in that are just crumbling and now tuition's going way up anybody here in the state of connecticut i don't have kids but i've got people uh, friends of mine that have kids anybody who wants to get into yukon they can't afford it now period because tuition's gone up and that's because of the loss of football so rich people you know want money but they also want to look like good guys too and they want to look like they care about education and that's where we're at yeah it, uh, it all comes together in one shot and they all want and Look, it, then there's the flip side of this. I went to Wisconsin. I was I was there in 1988 when they were literally ranked, I think, by Sagarin, the worst. There was like 110 college football programs. I think they were 116th with a bunch of FCS or D1AA teams at the time ranked higher than them. And the powers that be, Donna Shalala, Mike Richter, and then Barry Albert, they made a conscious decision that said, we are going to make the athletic department good. 
which then is going to expand the university. And sure enough, after I left, the place became great at athletics. And now the, uh, the academic profile has gone through the roof. The number one example of that right now, Alabama, where they have gone all in on National Merit Scholar. If you're a National Merit Scholar, they, Alabama will pay you to go to the University of Alabama because it's all started with the profile raised by the football program. And then all of a sudden, those to your exact point, those same rich people were like, all right, yeah, we got great football. We always had great football. How do we make Alabama up there with the world-class institutions? Well, we got to upgrade the student body as well. So now we're going to go after the best students in America where they're getting people who would never even give Alabama a second look. But now if you're going to, you know, my niece thought it was a perfect student all the way around almost went there because they were going to just give her everything to go there. So it's so the football program, so those rich people – can expand the other side as well, but it doesn't work in the reverse. I'm always shocked. I do have a kid who's about to go to college and UCLA, they got 112, 20,000 uh, ent- uh, applications this year and have like a 3% uh, acceptance rate. I'm always shocked when the football player goes, I don't mean to college team here, but goes from UCLA to just name the other school that's not UCLA right now. It's like, you're in one of the greatest academic institutions in the world, but that factors into that not at all at this point. No, it, it doesn't. And, and academics, like, I mean, uh, your, your kid can try to get into UCLA and someone with a, you know, 960 SAT can get in because they play football. And it's an unfair world. It always has been. It's never been equal. It never will be. The, the Notre Dames of the world have to recruit at a different academic level than anybody else in the SEC not named Vanderbilt. And that's just life. But there is such a thing as rich guilt. I've, I've become aware of that as well. And rich guilt, I haven't experienced or benefited from rich guilt. No one's given me a million dollars just because they felt guilty. Uh, but the, the rich guilt is where you see all these billionaires and millionaires being philanthropists. And so if you're going to go big in football, as you mentioned, the rich guilt kicks in. And how can we make Alabama better for the non-football player. And so I think that's one of the big concerns here from a federal government look, but also from a look of college football itself. Right now, it's the haves, and it's been more the haves than it ever has been before, at least in my opinion, with Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, Georgia, pretty much every playoff. Yep. Um, and now they're worried more about those programs and teams that may just fade away and turn into UConn. And nobody cares about UConn. But if there's 20 UConns out there, it's bad PR and press because the pro- academics the- have to be part of college football. They just and have then, to be, or should be and then football. There- and then there's the haves and have nots to your specific point here on UConn. Once you take the, remember, you and I know, everyone who's listening to this knows what we're talking about. Every senator and congressman, but maybe 10, know exactly the ins and outs of what we're talking about here. So what happens when, and this is the risk that I think these, these, that they're not thinking this through, what happens when Congress person X says, okay, we'll help you out here. What about, why aren't the UConn women's basketball player is getting paid why aren't they getting the the equal amounts here um i'm i'm a you know pro in this way i'm a pro business guy all the way around where look look you can support yourself and generate revenue then yeah go you know, get it you see all the time now in the nil world how women's sports are being able to find ways to generate revenue in certain ways but at some point they're going to say hey this is great if you're alabama football but what if you are south carolina women's basketball or some other sport that does uh, generate interest, but doesn't generate the same sort of revenue, they're going to start to dive into the equal playing fields because that's what Congress is going to want to do. And so I kind of, th- again, I going back to our original talk here, I think if you're these conference commissioners, just, you're okay, you've got it. You, you, this is your perfect system. You don't have to pay your, your people. Just let it play out. Just Just put a kibosh, put a limit on the transfer portal, make it a two-week thing in March or two-week thing in June or both or whatever, figure that out and say open feeding season and that's it. And then on on top of that, okay, however you want to give these guys money, go for it once they're in your school. So it's it's just a a way hard thing to do. It's a great strategy pre-social media. It's impossible now. It just is impossible. 
you know, people weren't getting canceled for stupid reasons back in 2007 when we were having college football expansion. And, 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 you know, again, there was lobbying to government officials. I mean, geez, Virginia and Virginia Tech were tied at the hip. And if Virginia yeah. didn't get in and then West Virginia got screwed because of that and West Virginia couldn't find a home, the SEC didn't want them. Then the Big 12 took them. And now West Virginia is sort of like a, a fish out of water in the Big 12, all because of this jostling. But there was no social media. There was no outcry. There was nobody talking. When people talk, people have to listen in this day and age. If people come for you or me on Twitter, our bosses, I don't have one now. So my, 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 my dog, so, they will listen. They have yeah. to listen. And it's stupid because most of the people coming for you and most of the people talking about it are complete imbecile morons, but people listen to them and they actually overreact to the imbecile morons more than they react to the smart people. So well, I get what you're saying, but they're not going to sit still. They're not going and, to. And much that's, pressure. And that's the problem where what, what happens when the uh, senator from, from Connecticut is saying, why isn't UConn a, a part of this whole thing? And, and you asked before why the SEC would want uh, Texas and Oklahoma. Well, Oklahoma for the football. I mean, Texas all of a sudden immediately becomes the second best academic institution in the SEC, maybe depending on Florida on the right ranking in days, maybe third behind Vanderbilt. So all of a sudden, you know, Texas just completely jacked up the academic profile uh, of the SEC in one fell swoop. Um, that's why you want them. So to, to the Congress point is look at look at the excitement around the base when like BYU is now going into the Big 12, Houston and Cincinnati and UCF, just, just how jacked those programs are with massive uh, Roman, massive fan bases. And then the political side of this is uh, the representative in the Orlando area or the Cincinnati area or whatever area is like, hey, we're now in the big time of college sports now. And this is a good thing. Well, what about the, the one who's representing, you know, Mount Pleasant, Michigan and Central Michigan or something like that? It's 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 a harder push. And that's where those uh, senators and representatives are going to get more into this and start asking those exact questions. Like you said, we're like. How come Alabama's getting all this help? What about our school, <laughs> well, which has 40,000 students and isn't getting a break at all when it comes to college athletics? And look at these teams that are now going to be power five. They're going to look at, at the group of five and they're going to look down on them. They're going to be like, UCF, Cincinnati. I know, you know, Houston, I know they're going to be like, oh, that's never going to happen to us. We've been there before. No, no. You're going to look down on them. You're not going to care about them. No one's going to care about them. Other people will have to care about them. But the bottom line, it comes down to money. The academic footprint in the SEC, Texas, brings money, a lot yep. of money. And if the SEC didn't get them, someone else was going to get them, and the SEC didn't want to lose them. So greed <clears throat> is going to drive the mega conference, and the government is going to have to slow down this this disparity between the, the 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 Texas Longhorns and the Duke Blue Devils they're just going to have to figure it out and that's why the federal government's eventually going to get involved and put a cap on this stuff I, I as for the portal real quick you know you can limit it they don't have they they so let's say you, you give a two-week window in the spring and a, and a two-week window after the season There's, it's unmanageable Nobody yeah. can handle that. Nobody can handle that. Coaches can't handle right now at the end of the season, coaches have to handle bowl game preparation. They have to handle early signing period. They have to handle the transfer portal. Um, and, and uh, what else do they have to handle? Everything else, the, the whims and the, the, the late nights of 18 to 23 year old college students. Yeah. I mean, you know, you've got a two week period there from the, from the beginning of December to the early signing period, and the JUCO early signing period or JUCO signing period where you have to like recruit a thousand kids. Now the high school kids you've been recruiting for four years. So you can, you can sort of touch back with them and you're constantly talking to them. The portal kids, they're in there. And well, sometimes you've already recruited, sometimes you lost a kid through the portal. And like, the, yeah, sometimes you lost a kid and you recruited them and it was between you and XYZ yeah, State. You have a connection. You, you already kind of know them a little bit. So that's kind of what, right. But, 
The shelf but life they, is a week. It's a week. You've you got a week to recruit that kid. You know who's doing this really well? It's going to be the real interesting uh, test case. Billy Napier. He, from day one, when he got to Florida, younger guy, understands this, the world of social media, understands the younger type of player. From day one, he was a CEO. He's like, here's our uh, NIL division. Here is our transfer portal division. Here is our defensive backfield division. And like every school has this to some extent, like the Alabama's throw 97 assistants at everything. Right. But he was, he was the first one who on his, on his first press conferences were like, we got to handle all these different things. And we need to have someone who's in charge of each of these separate areas. And we have to run this like the business, the multi-billion dollar business it is. And I think he's going to be an interesting test case to see just how smooth this all operates from a talent acquisition standpoint to a recruiting standpoint to a, a, if they're making the money standpoint, if everyone's out of getting a Gatorade deal and all the other side. He seemed to be the one young up and coming coach who has a, has a handle on this just about better than anybody else. Do you want to know why? It's because he went into Gainesville and he saw what a nightmare it is. He had to blow the whole thing up. Yeah. <laughs> Jim McElwain and Dan Mullen. It, it's like, you know, they had this beautiful car, right? And they had a garage, but they left it out in the driveway. They never washed it. There's bird crap all over it. They never, <laughs> they never turned it over. The engine's dead. Uh, they let thieves come in. It's up on blocks. I mean, they just let this beautiful, beautiful football program that is Florida go to crap. And Billy Napier came in, and I know this from some staffers, and looked at it and like, oh, my God. Like, the only thing we can do with this is just put a bomb, ignite it, and blow this whole thing up and start anew. My worry for Billy Napier, and again, we'll get to all this stuff in future podcasts and things like that because we're getting on a tangent um, and we should wrap it up because people don't like to listen to us for too long. The only <laughs> thing I worry about for Billy Napier is are they going to be patient enough because they're just not a patient group in Florida. They're just not. They weren't patient. Yeah, I, as, you're, as you're saying that, there's two things uh, about that. All that is true. And if they convert that, they call a better two point conversion uh, play against Alabama. And they take him to overtime and pull that off. It's a beautiful car. Everything's yeah. going to be fine. Everything runs Ooh. just smoothly after that. Yeah, and the other part, screwed. they're still screwed. Yeah. I'll tell you what, it's like someone came in and detailed the car and put new tires on it and all that. And they're just going to let it rot again. Dan Mullen being gone from there is great. And them not winning the SEC championship was the best thing that could happen to them because <laughs> it, it just wasn't sustainable the way it is. And, and people don't understand that, but you're right. I mean, they were so close, but also look at how fickle this fan base is. Six games into Every the next season, base. they had a they had a they had a bad three weeks, and they won like, and, and, and they and gone. That's gone. it. You can't lose. And that's why back to the Texas thing again. We're we're doing like fifty-seven podcasts in one here. Back to the Texas thing. You can't have a two-game losing streak in the SEC ever. No. You can't. Like LSU people are already mad that Brian Kelly didn't win a national championship already. There. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just an insane. Uh, sort of conference. And then to the oh. entire point of this whole thing, you and I are talking about this it is the fun off season stuff. But as a really wise man once told me, once the ball gets kicked off, nobody cares. All the NIL stuff, all the transfer portal stuff, whoever is in my uniform on the day on August 27th or September 3rd, when That's we're in the stadium and we're watching all, all the ball gets kicked off. I love you. You're my team. And then it's all good from there. And then I college know, football goes together. But come on. I mean, it's, it's, it sucks. If I'm a Pitt fan, I want the guy that we helped develop from a three-star recruit in Maryland that not a lot of schools wanted to be my Larry Fitzgerald. I want to brag about something. I lost Kenny Pickett. I lost my offensive coordinator. I lost my wide receiver. You got Keaton on Slovis. You got it. <laughs> that's not you the might same. Have upgraded. You might have I want, upgraded from picking I want my now. guy and I want to be able to tell Ohio State know, receivers better than yours and I want to be able to tell Texas that and I want to be able to tell LSU that he's better than Keishon Butte and Pitt fans <laughs> won't have that and it's because of NIL and I get it it's just life life is unfair and I'm not trying to make it fair because there's just no way to make it fair but somebody has to step in and not allow these rich guys to overtake the athletic offices because they will they will overrun it they will overtake it and then they will be in charge 
not the head coach, not the athletic director, not the president, but the big boosters. And if that happens, college football is going to suffer greatly. But we're going to wrap it up here. Follow Pete Futek. Uh, it's Pete, F-I-U-T-A-K at Twitter. Um, it's collegefootballnews.com. Uh, you can follow me at M Farrell sports on Twitter, um, mixing it up and you can follow me, me on my website, I guess, Mike Farrell sports.com. Um, you know, it's funny. Tom Brady's got two jobs. I got none. I got no job. <laughs> so it's it, now I'm going to put Tampa it on gig will be open. The Tampa Bay quarterback gig will be open. Go, go apply. I'm going to put it out on Twitter and say, he's got two jobs. I've got none. What's the differences between me and Tom Brady? Really? Nothing. Honestly. Nothing. Just to tell. I, I, I guarantee it. you it's going to be worth 90 comments. And every one of them is going to be about me being fat, ugly, and not smart, but I welcome it. It's going to be fun, but follow Pete, follow me. <laughs> we'll be doing this again because we got on so many different tangents and we didn't really dive into anything college football except for the political portion of it. And because there's what, nothing to talk about because of everything Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State. There we go. That's that's, that's what May is about, though. May is about that now, and that's fine. At least we have something to talk about. This is probably the most controversial offseason since conference realignment in 2007, and that was kind of crazy. So That was fun. Maybe it's a good thing. Um, it's a little crazy to cover, and people don't like it but they like to dive into the, the drama of it all. And there's plenty of people drama. don't like it until they get Jordan Addison coming to their school. Then well, all of a sudden this is a great thing. Yeah. I mean, listen, it, it, and, and to those fans of, you know, teams that have had multiple Heisman winners and won multiple national championships and maybe on rough times, I don't care. You try to be a fan <laughs> of a team that sucks forever and has never won anything. That's when you're a real fan. So people, whenever people ask me who are the best fans in college football, I'll say the temp, the Temple Owl season ticket holder. You know, yeah. the, the UConn, the UConn season yeah. ticket. Anybody could be an Ohio State fan. And they're the worst because they're happy. Well, they're all but drunk. like yeah. <laughs> Everybody I know at UConn is drunk at the games because it's the only way to stay warm and it's the only way to watch that horrible football. But yes, they are true fans. Um, now, if there weren't alcohol, I don't know what would happen. But listen. The true fans, a true fan. Thank God for people who are listening at this point to this podcast that were too far. If you're if you're not an alcohol at this point, then the, the oh, they gotta minutes be. The I mean, we're fifty minutes. You're screwed. You're I'm screwed. gonna wrap it up here. I appreciate your time. We'll do this again. Thank you very much. Anytime, Mike.